about a year ago, we, we added a, a class on uh, Sunday morning during Bible study for young adults, and uh, I just came, came out of teaching that for three weeks in one piece, and uh, what a wonderful group, uh, not because of the teacher, but because of those who are in it. If you're looking for a class for young adults that will encourage you, Please check that out on Sunday mornings at 9. And uh, this, this quarter, the elders sort of sharing, going in and teaching. And uh, Luke taught her a couple quarters. And um, just a really great group to be with. I appreciate them. As a church, I would like us to pursue a theme this year, uh, both as we uh, open the scriptures together on Sunday mornings as well as in our general practice, in the things we say and do as, as Christians. Uh, we're not going to talk about this every week from the pulpit, but probably at least every month. And I hope it will become obvious over time how some of the, the activities and the ministries that we involve ourselves in this year go hand in hand with this theme. Uh, some of them will be new things. And some of them will be things we've been doing all along, but perhaps with a renewed interest or a different take. Uh, what in the world am I talking about? Glad you asked. Let's, let's begin with our theme passage for the year. I want to start with this a little differently by giving you a couple of paraphrases of the passage first before we read it from a more standard translation. The first paraphrase is by a scholar named N.T. Wright. He translated the New Testament. He called that translation the Kingdom New Testament. And this is how he renders the passage. If anyone supposes that they are devout and does not control their tongue but rather deceives their heart, such a person's devotion is futile. As far as God the Father is concerned, pure, unsullied devotion works like this. You, sh you should visit orphans and widows in their sorrow and prevent the world leaving its dirty smudge on you. The second uh, rendering is by Eugene Peterson in his translation called The Message. And here's how he handles this passage. He says, anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father, is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight and guard against corruption from the godless world. And finally, uh, here it is from the English Standard Version, which I frequently use when I speak before you on Lord's Day. And, uh, oh, by the way, the passage in focus here is James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Here's what the English Standard Version says there. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, the word that's repeated about three times in that text, of course, is religion. Or as uh, one of the other translators renders it, devotion. It's a word that refers to outward expressions of belief or religious faith. Another good way to translate it would be uh, worship. I know that the word religion or religious has fallen on hard times. A lot of people have a negative view of religion. 
Even people who are very religious have a negative view of that word. Worship, on the other hand, is uh, still a word that's, that's a little bit in vogue. And so if that helps you understand it here, think of it that way. But either word, religion or worship, expresses the idea just fine. So what, is, what does James say to us here? James says that it is possible for a person to consider themselves religious or consider themselves a worshiper of God, but actually to be fooling themselves. Now I'm certain that no one wants to do that. No one wants to be fake. No one wants to be wasting their time going to worship, attending a church regularly, and it all be a total waste of time. Who wants uh, and who has time to be wasting time? No one. None of us. No one wants to be a hypocrite. No one wants to be an imposter or fake. But James says it can happen. And, and James, of course, is not the only person in the Bible that points this out. Many do, in fact, including Jesus our Savior. Uh, but we'll come to what he said about it on down the line this year. I thought uh, as an, an additional example of this today that we would listen to the sort of strident words of an Old Testament prophet that um, we rarely pay attention to, a fellow named Amos. In chapter 5 of the, the record of his prophecy, Amos quotes God. So these words are God's words. And God says this to a, a very reputationally religious people, Israel. God says this to Israel. Listen to what God said according to Amos. He said, I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. God goes right down the line, almost with all their acts of worship, mentioning them all, and saying that he, God, the one they were supposedly worshiping, hates them all, hates all their acts hates their worship, hates their religious performance, doesn't enjoy them, doesn't accept them, doesn't even watch as they worship. Imagine the God of Israel did not log in and watch the live stream of Israel's worship. Why? Well, the hint comes in verse 24 of the text, Amos 5. There was a problem with their justice and their righteousness. Back in the New Testament now, James chapter 1. James also says there are some things that could make our religion worthless, our worship unacceptable to God. There are some ways that we as worshipers could fool ourselves into thinking that, we're, that what we're doing this morning is worthwhile rather than 
a waste of God's time. And we're not going to go into great detail or depth on these this morning, but over time we'll, we'll pursue them as we look at this theme. But, but what are those things that would get us into a situation where we could be fooling ourselves? Well, in verse 26, James 1, the first one is mentioned, and it's having an uncontrolled, unspiritual tongue. Having an ungodly mouth can ruin otherwise good worship. If I use my mouth, my words, to consistently hurt others, to wound others, to terrorize others, then it really doesn't matter what a good game I talk or sing on Sunday in worship because my worship is useless, vain, empty. My worship in such a situation makes God sick. Makes him want to tune, tune me out when I open my mouth. And then there are three other things here that follow in verse 27. The first two have to do with precious people in need in our midst. First, those who are without parents, orphans, those that lack a home life that is what God desires for them, without father, without mother, or both. What about them? If we, as religious people, as Christian worshipers, if we as a church neglect these children in need, then it doesn't really matter if we come to church on Sunday and perform all the prescribed acts of worship correctly and with great gusto. It doesn't really matter because God in heaven is stopping up his divine ears until we start serving those he is most concerned with. Those who are burrowed deepest in his heart. That is the vulnerable, the weak, those without protection. What is what is God like deep down? One of the great places to study that is the Psalms. And Psalm 68 answers that question this way in verse 5. Here's what God is like. Father of the fatherless, and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. Now, there is a verse you ought to commit to memory. Father of the fatherless and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. James, in chapter 1, verse 27, says it this way. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. Another verse we ought to memorize. So what can waste my worship? Well, my wicked words can, but also to neglect the most vulnerable and needy people around me. That can do it as well. <laughs> to neglect children who don't have the home life they ought to have. And, and people like widows who have lost their husbands and widowers as well. People who have suffered major losses in their life and are just struggling as a result of that. These are the people on God's heart, folks. 
These are the people he's concerned about. And, and while it is indeed great and, and, and commanded of us to come together and to practice our religion, that is to worship God, if we do it and never think about or pray for or serve those in need, then we have a problem with the God we're singing to on Sunday. And then finally in verse 27, one other thing that can really wreck our worship and, and devastate our devotions. What is it there? It's letting the world muddy us up. If we bring too much world with us into this building on Sunday, we might have a problem. I mean, if we are totally different people on Sunday morning than we are on Monday morning, or every other day, there are issues with our religion. It just might be worthless, empty. I had to learn this the hard way. Can I share a personal story? I'm not proud of it. I've told you before that I grew up in the church. I grew up spending Sunday mornings like this and Sunday evenings and Wednesday nights and any other time. Things were going on with the church. That's how I was raised. I also grew up on the basketball court. Played basketball through my growing up years in high school and and even through college. Sometimes those two worlds were in conflict in me. Now I played basketball in an era before uh, the nice almost antiseptic kind of basketball to, of, of today, AAU and we had officials, everything. I, I played on uh, the mean asphalt courts of the city where you had to survive and you learned rough ways, sharp elbows, sometimes fists, always bad language, you know, that you can imagine. This was how I was trained and raised and even, even in organized basketball. I had people tell me that I was tough to play against. Not because I was so fast or could jump so high, but I hit hard. I had a guy tell me once, you're the dirtiest player I ever played against. That wasn't a compliment. Well, <clears throat> eventually my official career ended because I wasn't that good. And um, and I, I began to serve in churches, in ministry, youth ministry, and various areas of ministry in local churches. No longer playing on asphalt court or in college or high school team, but uh, playing in church league basketball. And it's not so easy to give up the uh, old ways of violence and bad language, you know just because you're now in church league basketball. That may surprise you, but it's not. And I had to learn by being told by, by several people over a period of time um, that the way I conducted myself, they didn't appreciate. And that when they first met me, it was used on, in, in that setting, they didn't like me much because uh, they didn't like the way I knocked them down or the language I used or the way I conducted myself. It took me a couple of years at least to realize I was ruining my witness for Jesus in front of people. That was humbling. But I was 
I was ruining my religion because of things I said and did. I had to learn the hard way. Pure religion involves much more than what you say and do on Sunday morning. It involves how you treat people on Monday through Saturday as well, including on the field and on the court and on the job. We need to live unpolluted lives before God the Father. Now, he makes that possible through the power he offers us, the, the spirit within us. We can't do it on our own, but we have to make an effort. And with him, with him living in us, we can do it. Pure religion, right worship involves controlling our tongue, taking care of those in need, and keeping ourselves unstained from the world. Let's practice that kind of religion as best we can until the Lord returns to take us home. And let's, let's learn more about pure religion as a church this year. And, and let's follow through and live it out as best we can. I thank you for listening this morning. I pray you'll think about these things and study them with me as we go through. This morning we offer an invitation from the Lord. Maybe you need to come before us asking for prayer or, or desiring to make a, a commitment to him. We would love to take time and help you with that. Maybe there's one or more here this morning ready to give their life to Jesus for the first time, to meet him in the waters of baptism. And if that's, if that's the case, everything is ready for you to do that. We invite you to do that as well. Please think about these, these things and your response while we stand and sing this song.